It was my birthday this week, so I thought why not share one of my favourite books with you. I discovered this tale of creativity, love and harsh satire quite a number of years back and have been obsessed ever since. What could be more intriguing, after all, than the devil visiting Moscow? Welcome aboard the International Express to Book Central. Grab a seat, settle in, and let's while away the journey with some book chat. Today, we're going to talk about The Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov, a Ukrainian-Russian author from the 20th century. While I'll get into his background and his struggles against censorship a little more later, I do want to say up front that he was one of many authors whose work and expression was hampered by the Soviet state. Even with the current state of Russian aggression against Ukraine, I think it's important to still highlight authors that are technically Russian, if you consider it genre-wise, and their literature that explores what it was like to try and create and communicate under such pressures. And Bogokov himself was born in what is now Ukraine, after all. So let's dive into what is probably his best-known work. The Master and Margarita starts thus. Chapter 1. Never Talk to Strangers At the hour of the hot spring sunset at Patriarch's Ponds, two citizens appeared. The first of them, some forty years old and dressed in a nice grey summer suit, was short, well-fed, and bald. He carried his respectable pork-pie hat in his hand, and had a neatly shaved face adorned by spectacles of supernatural proportions in black horn frames. The second, a broad-shouldered, gingery, shock-headed young man, with a checked cloth cap cocked towards the back of his head, was wearing a cowboy shirt, crumpled white trousers, and black soft shoes. So yes, that's a very descriptive opening, but the details are important in The Master and Margarita. The novel is really made up of kind of three different storylines, or maybe two, so I'm going to tell you about those initially separately, because the book is divided into two parts, and in the first part of the book, each of these storylines is kind of set up differently before they come together in the second part. The first storyline is about how the devil comes to visit Moscow and causes absolute mayhem, as you would expect. The two gentlemen we've just met in the opening are called Mikhail Alexandrovich Berlioz and Ivan Nikolaevich Ponirev. And during their evening stroll, they encounter an odd, maybe German foreigner, or maybe he's Dutch, they're not entirely sure. But this man keeps talking about, like, Jesus, and he has odd predictions about their futures. They're not entirely fond of their encounter with him, and it becomes even worse when his predictions come true almost immediately, because, you see, Berlioz is beheaded by a tram, and Ivan is shipped off to an insane asylum, as he was wandering through Moscow in his underwear, babbling about satanic foreigners after witnessing the death of his friend. And yes, that is exactly what this stranger, or this foreigner, called Professor Woland, had predicted. And that is only the beginning of the strange things that are about to perform Moscow, starting at the literary club of which Berlioz was a president and Ivan was a member. They're in an uproar, of course, as literary types will be. So this stranger, called Professor Roland, is very much the devil. He never calls himself the devil, but I do think he gets called Satan at certain times, so it's pretty obvious. that That's not a conjecture on my part. Boland has arrived in Moscow, and he's not on his own. He's accompanied by a valet called Goroviev, a walking-talking black cat called Biamov, and Azazello, a hitman. There's also a witch, and I love her. Together, they settle into Berlioz's apartment and convince a theatre manager to sign them on for a residency at the Variety Theatre. There, they get up to all kinds of hijinks on stage, which involves a potential decapitation slash reattachment of a head, and all their other tricks, which are meant to reveal how money-hungry and hypocritical the Russian elite really is. The scenes in the theatre are amazing. They're some of my favourites, and people are tricked into kind of taking off their clothes and running after money, and just really revealing the worst about themselves. Now, this is kind of the first storyline in the first part of the book. The second storyline takes place in Jerusalem, 
during the trial of Jeshua Hanotsri, also known as Jesus of Nazareth. Our focus point there really is Pilate and about how his character is affected by Jeshua. We also meet Levi Matthew, who is following Jeshua around and writing down his words and deeds, something which Jeshua's maybe not super pleased about. As someone raised Christian, I found this storyline super interesting, especially as it's written by an author from the officially atheist Soviet Union. But it's not immediately clear why we kind of get chapters about these characters interspersed with the devil's adventures in Moscow. A third storyline concerns one of the characters in the title of the book, and really also the second. And these are the master and Margarita themselves. See, when Ivan arrives in the insane asylum at the beginning of the novel, he encounters a mysterious other inhabitant who only goes by the name of the Master. Ivan himself is a young poet, full of ideas and aspirations, but the Master is an embittered elderly author whose work was just ripped apart by the literary journal Berlioz was the head of and just by critics in general. And this is also where that second storyline becomes relevant, because as it turns out, the Master's book was a novel about Pontius Pilate and Christ. The criticism on the novel had been so bad that he burned his manuscript and left his lover, Margarita, behind. He's sure she has forgotten him, and all hope feels lost to him. Now here's where we move into part two of the novel at the 19th chapter, which is called Margarita. And I love the opening of this chapter, so I'm going to share it with you as well. <clears throat> Follow me, reader. Who told you there is no genuine, true, everlasting love in the world? Let the liar's filed tongue be cut off. Follow me, my reader, and only me, and I shall show you such love. No, the master was mistaken in the hospital when he told Ivanushka with bitterness at that hour when the night was slipping past midnight that she had forgotten him. That could not have been. Of course, she had not forgotten him. Margarita is one of my favorite characters ever, probably from any book. She has no idea where the master is at the beginning of part two, but she refuses to give in to the despair that he felt when she last saw him. The situation is kind of complicated by the fact that she is still married, but her upper class life is absolutely stifling to her and now with the disappearance of the master she's kind of come to the point where she's considering potentially just leaving life but then she's found by Azazello, one of Woden's accomplices and he gives her a magical ointment which allows her to fly through the sky and she visits Woland at the good friday ball at midnight and he offers her the choice to become a witch the scenes of her kind of flying through the night sky and discovering this new freedom and empowerment are just amazing, as is the entire section where she hosts the Spring Ball together with Woland, and all kinds of dark and historical figures come to visit. Because Woland makes her the deal that if she co-hosts this ball with him, she will receive a wish from him. And so, at the end of the ball, after she's done her very best, he is willing to grant her that wish. She has all kinds of potential wishes, but during the ball, she met a woman who's being eternally punished for something that just breaks Margarita's heart. And so she asks if this woman can be released from her eternal punishment in hell. Woland says that Margarita has already freed her and still, therefore, has a wish open with him. And so she asks for the master to return to her. Together, they get to go back to their little love nest in the basement apartment they once shared. With all his mischief in Moscow completed, Woland gets a visit from Matthew Levi, who tells him it has been decided that the master Margarita will be sent to the afterlife. And so the two die and their souls ride away from Moscow together with Satan and his troop. They ride away into space and the master Margarita will get to stay together forever after the trials they faced in a little house with cherry trees. Upon the disappearance of Wolan and his accomplices, Moscow is not entirely sure what to make of all the weird things that have been happening, but they decide to ascribe it to mass hypnosis and just a strong dose of hysteria. That is the Master of Margarita. Now that you know what the book is roughly about, let's get into who Bulgakov was just a little bit more. Mikhail Bulgakov was born in Kiev, which was then a part of the Soviet Union, in 1891. 
His father died when he was only 18, and his mother took control of his education at that point. She herself was apparently a very well-educated and determined lady. In 1913, Bogokov married for what would be the first time, but not the last, and he married Tatyana Lapa. During World War I, Bogokov volunteered for the Red Cross and passed his medical exams, after which he was sent to the front line in western Ukraine. During this time, he began to write short stories, which were later republished as A Young Doctor's Notebook. This wasn't the first time he wrote, though. Apparently, during his childhood, he would write little plays for him and his many siblings to perform. However, during his stint at the front line, he was apparently infected by something while helping a patient, and he developed something of a morphine addiction in trying to cure this. During the Civil War, which followed the revolutions in Russia in 1917 and 1918, he and his wife lived in Kiev again, where he was occasionally drafted into service as a doctor. As a part of the White Army, he contracted typhus, and he almost died. As the Soviets rose to power, most of his family emigrated to Paris, and I don't think he ever saw them again after that. Following his recovery from typhus, Bogokov devoted himself to writing full-time, and he and his wife moved to Moscow. They apparently lived close to Patriarch's Pond, where the Master Margarita starts. He worked as a correspondent for newspapers, all while also working on his own novels and plays, and I think even poems, which combined kind of satire and weird supernatural elements. All of his works were also already concerned kind of with ethical issues, trying to blend the supernatural with the real. In 1924, he got divorced for the first time and decided to get married again to Lyubov Belozerskaya. A weird thread throughout Bogokov's life is his strained relationship with the government, but also specifically with Stalin. When Bogokov was initially criticized by Moscow's theater directors, Stalin personally kind of intervened and said that he was a writer of great quality who kind of transcended party politics. Stalin apparently saw Bogokov's play The Days of the Turbans 15 times. But while Bogokov's plays were often very popular with audiences, they were torn apart by critics and frequently banned by the government. In 1929, his career was pretty much over because any publication of his works and plays was just stopped by censorship. And this is when he wrote a letter directly to Stalin asking for permission to emigrate. Clearly, the Soviet Union didn't want his writing, so why couldn't he go write somewhere else? He apparently received a phone call from Stalin asking if he was serious about leaving, and this was of course not necessarily, I think, a friendly phone call. Bogokov was eventually allowed to continue working in the theatre, but this didn't last long. I will admit I sometimes feel a bit weird about the whole Stalin thing, just because that man was an absolute war criminal, in my opinion. But I also don't think we can kind of judge Bogokov for trying to get his work published, trying to make a living and somehow survive, can we? I have no idea what it would be like to try and work under such government pressure as writers were facing under the Soviet Union and now again under Putin. Bogokov's work clearly shows that he was deeply aware of the flaws of the USSR, and especially The Master and Margarita shows some of that fear people felt living under such scrutiny. And it's also worth noting again that Bogokov himself came from Kiev, which was then under Soviet control. He was not in any way someone in Stalin's inner circle or anything like that, just an author with talent trying to make a living. And that double-edged knife of like Stalin's attention is also so noticeable throughout his life. On the one hand, Stalin kind of protected him against incarceration, punishment, and potentially execution, and the man liked his plays, but... On the other hand, Stalin made it absolutely impossible for Bogokov to work or to leave. So yeah, I think it's important to know about Bogokov's background and kind of how he tried to survive because it provides extra insight into that period, but also into the novel itself. But we can still feel a bit ambivalent about it. I just don't think we can judge too harshly one way or another when it comes to people like Bogokov. With that said, let's get back to the timeline of his life. So his career was pretty much over, right, by 1930. But in 1932, he married for a third and final time, this time to Yelena Shilovskaya, who inspired the character of Margarita. 
By this time, he had also begun working on The Master and Margarita, but most of his work, which was quite critical of the Soviet state, never saw the light of day. The things that did somehow get published, and which did get through the censors, was heavily criticized. While Stalin's favor still meant he wasn't arrested, it didn't mean he was able to write or publish or make a living. His work was once again completely banned in the late 30s, and he again asked for permission to leave Russia, which he wasn't allowed to do. Bulgakov dedicated the last few years of his life to the master and Margarita, all while his health was declining and he struggled with depression. In 1939, with the novel almost finished, he hosted a reading of the novel, which apparently terrified his wife and friends. Bulgakov still wanted to try and publish it, but they all feared that the attempt to do so would bring about horrible consequences, because it is not positive about Soviet Russia. However, on March 10th, 1940, Mikhail Bulgakov died from an inherited kidney disorder, without ever seeing his last novel published or finished. With that, let me tell you a little bit more about just how The Master and Margarita actually made it to an audience. As I said, it was written kind of between 1928 and 1940, so he spent a long time on this. And the pressure of the censors was so intense that Bulgakov actually burned the first manuscript draft of The Master and Margarita in 1930. The master in the novel actually does the same with the book that he's writing, and that's no coincidence. Bulgakov restarted writing the novel in 1931 and completed a second draft five years later. A further four drafts followed, but he stopped writing it about four weeks before his death in 1940. The final version at that point still had unfinished sentences and storylines that weren't entirely finished yet. Since then, different people have worked on creating proper versions of the novel, and I think the one you're most likely to find now was prepared by Lydia Yanovskaya, which is based on Bulgakov's material, of course. Because the material is unfinished, there is quite a big difference in translations as well, with some taking a lot of liberties, while others apparently kind of lose some of the flow of the Russian by being too strict or true in their translation. I myself read Hugh Applin's translation, and I do that at least once a year, and I enjoyed that translation very much. But yeah, the novel was kind of unfinished when he died. It did kind of come out in Russia, but only after Bulgakov's death, and it was serialized in 1966 and 67 in a journal. It was heavily censored, though, with many chapters either cut down, and apparently up to 12% of the novel had been removed. It did, however, come out as a book in Paris in 1967 because a manuscript had been smuggled out of the Soviet Union, and it also came out in Frankfurt in 1969. During these years, it did also circulate as a Zamizdat version, which was, according to Wiki, apparently a sort of dissident activity in which censored material was reproduced, kind of at home by people, and then passed around from reader to reader. So a version of The Master Margarita did circulate through Russia in that way as well. The famous quote, manuscripts don't burn, comes from this novel. And I'm very glad that the novel did find an audience in Russia itself, even despite the censorship and even before it was officially published. I think we can see a lot of Bogokov's misery and bitterness in the character of The Master, whether it's his disappointment in society itself, his anger about critics, and also just the burning of the manuscript and just losing all hope. But I think we can also see that there is still hope there, that Bogokov also still held out hope for a different kind of world, for a potential happy ending throughout the novel. So let's dive into the novel a little bit more. The Master and Margarita is an incredibly funny book, which may be surprising considering everything I've just told you about the devil, Jesus, censorship, and all of that. But it's a satirical work, and one of its aims is to poke fun at something and to draw out how exaggerated some of its behavior is. And the way Bulgakov does that, especially considering the circumstances, just blows me away every time I read it. He's constantly surprising you with his observations, and especially how he states certain observations, and how he kind of draws you as the reader in. So for example, when the literary club at the beginning is in an uproar because their president hasn't arrived yet, 
We get a little aside from the narrator saying that, well, of course, it would be very difficult for Berlioz to arrive now because he's currently lying in a morgue. So yeah, the humor is quite dark. But if that's also your sense of humor, then this is absolutely the book for you. This humor is also helped, like I said, by the fact that the narrator really speaks directly to you, addresses you as the reader, as he did in the opening to chapter 19 I read earlier. It really made me as the reader feel like I was on the same side as the narrator, that we were both given a kind of peek behind the curtain and making little kind of comments to each other. And on the other hand, it also works really well because on the one hand, the narrator knows so much. He has an insight into what is going on. But on the other hand, he doesn't have clear answers. He can't necessarily define for you what is happening or how certain people are feeling. He can only really tell you what is happening and you have to draw your own conclusions from that. The writing is also just, I think the word I would pick for it is sumptuous. <laughs> there are so many like details, which are also quite tactile about how something looked, maybe what kind of fabric it was, how the light shone, how things smelled how fresh the fish is that someone is eating, etc. Especially when we're at the Spring Bowl, organized by Woland and co-hosted by Margarita, there's an absolute flood of impressions and details and little glimpses at something which never becomes entirely clear, and it leaves you almost as overwhelmed as poor Margarita herself. But there is a lyricism to that, to this expansive world of which you only get to see certain things. And that lyricism also comes up in the more kind of philosophical and religious moments where the novel really soars, but where you also really have to kind of confront your own ideas about these things as a reader. For me, it really feels like the master in Margarita is interested in oppositions and how a normal person has to try and make their way kind of between the extremes of the world. We get to know the devil, but also Jesus in this novel. We get to see characters be at once incredibly cowardly and incredibly brave. Characters struggle immensely with how to hold on to the truth they know is true in a world where both the devil is playing with them and government authorities are refusing to accept the truth. A lot of these moments are based on Bulgakov's experiences and observations in Moscow. For example, when Woland and co. set up in Berlioz's apartment, this is a major big deal, which involves the police, because apartments were so scarce in Moscow at the time that they were actually controlled and assigned by the state. The suspicion towards foreigners and foreign currency is also drawn from real life, as is the kind of nonsense bureaucracy of the literary society for which Berlioz worked. Bulgakov is satirizing Soviet Russia, but he can only do so because he has seen the inside of it as well, and he can draw on these different extremes. His experience kind of observing all of this with the hypocrisy at the heart of any power, I think allowed him to write a book like this. But in the end, it is still up to you as the reader to decide how you feel about some of these things. Can you blame some of these people for the situations they kind of get themselves into? <laughs> or do you find yourself kind of more aligning with Woland and being like, yeah, let's draw these weird things out. Let's make these people actually consider who they are. And are you surprised, for example, that at the end, of course, they're like, nope, that was some weird hallucination. <laughs> Nothing happened. <laughs> we're all fine here. It's not like the devil and a talking cat were really here. What I also enjoyed, like I said earlier, is the character of Margarita, because I'm just so very fond of her, and not just because she gets to become a witch and fly around. But I'm also kind of struck every time I read the book again about by the question of like, why do I like her as much as I do? Because so much of her character is defined by her relationship with the master. And usually when I read books, I, I am not a big fan of women who are defined by the men in their lives, right? I think on the service level, it can kind of seem as if Margarita is just obsessed with the master and that is all she cares about. But really, what I think the novel is showing is how restricted her life is and how few choices she has and how the arrival of Woland, but also her relationship with the master kind of gives her a new lease on life. They allow her to explore certain things about herself, to kind of stretch her intellectual muscles and to experience things and to be, just be really alive. You know, and she isn't a clean or pure character in any way. I mean, she co-hosts a hellish ball with Satan himself. She flies through the night sky. But Margarita knows what she wants. And she's willing to do quite a bit to get there. And I found that very 
beautiful to read. And she's as much a part of this novel as the master is himself. And she's as crucial to his book getting written as the master is himself. And also, I think in the end, she is the one who saves him, really, which is also quite nice. Now, before I finish off here, as I've been going on quite a bit, I did want to say that I'm still just kind of pondering the end of the novel as well. I think it might be about forgiveness. Because in the end, the master releases Pilate from limbo, where he has been stuck ever since condemning Jesus to death, because he was too cowardly to either save him or admit to himself even that he was interested in what Jesus had to say. After being released, he and Jesus get to walk off deep in conversation. And I wonder whether this ending is meant to kind of, I guess, encourage us to forgive those who tormented us and to kind of leave them behind or let them be. Because in a way, that is what the master and Margarita get to do as well. They get to leave behind the lives that they hated in Moscow. And instead, they get to live together peacefully. They no longer have to worry about what critics say or what high society expects of them. I'm not entirely sure if that is the ending or an interpretation of the ending that Bobakov intended. But it is one of the things I drew out of it the last time I read the novel. The Master Margarita is, in my personal opinion, one of the best books ever written. Or at least the best one I've ever read. It's one of those. It's a good one. It is incredibly funny and so very just imaginative, but it's also quite terrifying in how sharp its observations are. It can lead you to consider the nature of love, what true freedom is, where the line between good and evil lies, what the price of creativity is, and so much more. Each time I reread this book, which I do about once a year, I get something new from it. New details pop out to me, and the kind of plight of the master Margarita hit me differently as well. I hope I've made you a little curious to read this book for yourself. There's so much more to it than I was able to get into here, but you'll find so much beauty in the pages of the novel itself. If you do give the book a go, or have read it already, let me know what you think of it. And that's it for today. If you have questions, thoughts on the book, or recommendations or requests for future episodes, feel free to leave a comment or send me an email at bookcentralpod at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. You can also subscribe to be informed when new episodes drop. You can find references to the materials used today in the description. Book Central is written and produced by me, and our music is by Scott Buckley. Thank you for joining me today on the International Express to Book Central.